Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for being here at our first Military Strategy Forum event of 2010. Uh, let me start by thanking our very generous sponsors, Rolls-Royce, and uh, I would be remiss if I neglected to give you the very sought-after gift. Is this a the CSIS coin? No, it's a Rolls-Royce. <laughs> oh, <right>. um, <laughs> Or at least a keychain, um, acceptable a, under the gift rules. Isn't a television ad like this or something? There, yeah. There's a light on there. It's a flashlight. Oh, a light. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a, light all too. this in a light too. Exactly. So. Let me. See. Where's Bill Taylor? I'll try it out on. <laughs> um, and that's how we'll pick up pick out uh, questioners as we when we get to the Q and A. Uh, we are continuing our series of combatant commanders. Uh, General Petraeus this morning, and uh, we're going to talk about the quiet little corner of the world known as Central Command. But before I start, I just want to make a few admin notes. First, please turn off your cell phones and Blackberries. Second, when we, are, when we do get to Q&A, if you could wait for the microphone, we've got a number of folks around with microphones. Uh, state your name and your affiliation, and please be succinct. And I will attempt to be mean and blame it on hormones if people get too verbose. Um, and finally, General Petraeus needs to take off at about 11.50 this morning to get to another event. So if everybody could stay seated as we uh, wrap this up and allow him to get out quickly, it would be much appreciated. So with that, let me introduce our very uh, well-known guest, General David Petraeus, uh, the commander of U.S. Central Command. And he may well be the best-known military officer on active duty today uh, for m many, many good reasons. Iraq. A recurring theme in your career. Um, he was the commander of the 101st Airborne in the first uh, year of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He became, later became the commander of Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq and NATO Transition uh, Mission Iraq, and then culminated his time there as the commander of Multinational Force Iraq. Uh, he has also served in Bosnia, Haiti, and Central America, I believe. Um, He's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, has had just about every command and staff position at some point, uh, both within the Army and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in international organizations, and interagency organizations. So he's pretty much done it all, and many of you may have heard he got some degrees from Princeton along the way. Um, and also picked up a few rewards and, or sorry, awards and, and other recognitions that just are a clear demonstration of how He's always been a very high performer. Uh, his commitment and integrity are reflected in all of that, and we are very honored to have him here as our guest. Thank you. For Thank you. That. Well, it's good to be with you, and um, you know, you have a couple of choices when you're in this position. Of course, we've got a whole staff of PowerPoint rangers out there. They're always <laughs> eager to provide the latest update. Actually, and so, so Tony Cordesman can take them then, by the way, and <laughs> repackage them and, and send them out, uh, which we are happy to have happen. <laughs> No, we are, no, truly. I mean, I think, I think, I think, actually, I think Tony will be the first to admit that there has been no more cooperative provider of uh, slides, metrics, data, and everything else uh, to him uh, since, I don't know when we started that, probably when I was the Minsticky commander. Uh, and it's quite a good partnership. And in return, uh, in truth, Tony has been a very good conscience for us at various times. And one reason we do these kinds of events is because it does it challenges us, it sharpens our thinking, it, it forces me to come to grips with uh, issues and so forth. And so I really am pleased to be back with CSIS because we have done this before. But each time I've done it before, again, we always sort of started out with a monologue of about 40 to 60 minutes of PowerPoint slides. And you know, they're very informative, I'm sure. Uh, but I thought what, what we would do and what we've done in a couple of cases recently is we do these so-called conversations. Now, having said that, of course, it is every Army Four Star's inalienable right to have PowerPoint slides. There's a little asterisk on the First Amendment. It, and, and if you read the fine print, it says general officers are allowed PowerPoint in addition to freedom of speech. Uh, and so I do have PowerPoint slides loaded up, and I guess they're going to be shown on either of these screens right here. Uh, there's some terrific folks that are sweating bullets out there trying to figure out which slide I might ask for. And we'll use them, uh, if necessary, to illustrate some of the answers, to, to give some of the metrics, in fact, that, uh, that Tony has helped us sharpen our thinking on candidly uh, as we've gone about the endeavors that we've been engaged in over the past couple of years. 
Um, I probably ought to say up front, Marin, just a reminder of what Central Command consists of now, because it did change on 1 October of 2008 when the U.S. African Command was uh, formally established and stood up. Uh, we have 20 countries now, uh, Egypt in the west to Pakistan, including Pakistan in the east, Kazakhstan in the north, and the waters off Somalia. Uh, we had to keep the pirate-infested waters uh, as well. Uh, and obviously a country or a region of uh, real contrasts, uh, the richest of the rich, some of the poorest of the poor, uh, innumerable religions, uh, ethnic groups, uh, tribal elements, uh, and so forth, uh, an area needless to say rich in energy resources, often poor in water, and a whole gamut of uh, levels of development of uh, government, uh, social structures, uh, political development, economic development, and so on. Um, no shortage of challenges. Uh, occasionally, I am asked, you know, what does the Central Command commander do? Um, and in some ca cases, I will respond that, you know, we're a little like the guy in the circus that gets a plate spinning on a stick uh, and then tries to get it going enough so we can go get another stick and another plate and get that one spinning. And the truth is, we got a fair amount of plates spinning out there, and we're trying to keep them all spinning, and even as we occasionally add a new plate, uh, or sometimes occasionally actually uh, are allowed to slow down the revolutions on another. But Yemen, of course, coming up while we obviously seek to sustain the gains uh, in Iraq. But with that, why don't I let you have the first question, Marin? Thank and you. And then we'll launch the conversation. Okay, sounds great. Um, I wanted to ask you about Iraq, and okay. actually more about Afghanistan than Iraq. Uh, you frequently talked when you were in Iraq about the Washington clock and the Baghdad mm -hmm. clock. And so my question is whether there is enough time on the Washington clock to make meaningful gains in Afghanistan and what we might see in the next year that yeah. will allow for the uh, Washington well, clock. Well, you're right. I mean, when we launched the surge, uh, you know, those questions loomed very large uh, for Ambassador Ryan Crocker and myself. We used to talk about the Washington clock and the Baghdad clock, and of course the Washington clock was racing forward. We weren't sure when it might expire. Um, indeed, there were some Washington clocks within Washington clocks, and of course the, the idea of facing the September 2007 testimonies uh, loomed very large in particular. Uh, and then there was the Baghdad clock, and that clock on some days seemed to go backwards, and you know, on other days you had to hit it to see if it was still working or not. But all, you know, it gradually started moving, and of course, uh, you know, there's really substantial progress there, uh, obviously, in the three years since the surge was launched. Uh, levels of violence down by well over 90 percent now, violent civilian deaths down by well over 90 percent, uh, high profile attacks down by over 90 percent, and all the rest. Having said that, innumerable challenges, and yet the latest one, of course, is this uh, political issue that is quite substantial that has sprung up where. Uh, an organization that really was supposed to have been replaced, uh, the former debathification committee supposed to have been placed, replaced by the Accountability and Justice Committee uh, by law, it never had its members replaced. Some of the old members uh, still manipulating things and came up with a list of over 500 individuals with links to the former, alleged links to the former Bath Party, and therefore said they ought to be disqualified as candidates for the election. Uh, this is uh, of enormous concern to the Iraqi political leaders. Uh, they are uh, quite feverishly behind the scenes uh, working out how to deal with this uh, and how to come to grips with an issue that could really undermine a key element in the progress over the last three years, which of course has been the reconciliation effort. By the way, it's been reconciliation not just with Sunni Arabs, which is seen as most prominent, of course, but also there's been reconciliation with a whole variety of Shia uh, elements as well. Uh, the release of Qais Ghazali recently, uh, for those who know about Assab al haq and all the rest of this, at the request of the Iraqi government was indeed to uh, further the process of reconciliation with that particular subset of uh, former Shia militia elements. Uh, but this could have a very, very uh, uh, difficult effect uh, on the Sunnis in particular, although there are some Shia on the list as well, uh, and could really reverse some of the progress. There is keen awareness of that by Iraqi political leaders, uh, and as I mentioned, they are indeed working very hard behind the scenes to figure out what could be an equitable and just resolution of that particular issue. 
back to Afghanistan and the Washington clock and the Afghan clock in this case. Um, I think that, uh, that it is possible to demonstrate progress, and that's what you're going to do in Afghanistan. You're not going to turn Afghanistan. I, I know, you know, Iraq was so horrific that I think there were really very, very few who thought there could be dramatic improvements. But if you knew what was possible there, and if you knew that if you could change certain aspects of what was doing, remember that Iraq was not just a surge of 30,000 forces, it was really a surge of ideas, emphasizing above all security of the population, uh, promoting reconciliation, living with the people to secure them, sharing their risks, 77 additional locations in Baghdad alone uh, for the occupation by our forces and Iraqi forces together, uh, being first with the truth, living our values, uh, all the rest of that. Um, and, and that enabled uh, the sort of the reclamation of some of these forces that if they could get back on the straight and narrow could really help and that was indeed among a number of different factors that led to the progress that took place there. Uh, I have personally always seen Afghanistan as different in that regard, and, and uh, I have stated on the record a number of occasions that in September 2005, on getting ready to come home from Iraq, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld put his arm around me and said, hey, really good job, you've done great stuff out here on this 15 and a half month tour is standing up the train and equip mission. Um, I'm really glad to hear you're gonna come home through Afghanistan. <laughs> looked at him, said, well, thanks for that, Mr. Secretary, but we'll be happy to do that. We put together a team, went over there and looked at their training and equip mission and came back and, you know, of course, developed some PowerPoint slides, one of which had on the top of it, the, the, the title was Iraq and the do not equal sign uh, uh, Afghanistan. And indeed then also offered that by the way, uh, not only were there a bunch of observations about the training and equip effort, but that overall I thought that Afghanistan was going to be the longest campaign in the long war. Um, and that I think, and that was by the way when the level of violence was considerably lower uh, than it has been over the course of the last uh, two years during which it hit each of those years and indeed the third year prior to that uh, has gone up significantly. So I think what, what the objective is in Afghanistan is one of demonstrating that progress can be achieved uh, with the appropriate approach uh, enabled by the additional forces and uh, the kinds of directives that General McChrystal has issued in the counterinsurgency guidance that he issued, his tactical directive, even the tactical driving directive. All of these essential if again you are truly going to uh, be seen not only just to secure the people but to serve the people. Uh, and not play into the insurgents hands. Of course a huge emphasis of his has been to reduce civilian casualties and indeed that is the case. And some of you may have seen in the press very recently uh, an assessment by uh, I think a, I forget which of the groups that uh, international groups that looks at civilian casualties and indeed announced that the vast majority of the civilian casualties in Afghanistan last year was caused by the insurgents by the Taliban and the other members of the extremist syndicate, not by ISAF, and in fact ISAF's numbers have continued to go down even as uh, the operations have expanded. So we have to show progress, we have to show that it can be done over time, and I think that's the key to maintaining time on the Washington clock, and by the way on the Kabul clock and the Afghan clock as well, because they also want to see after some eight or some so years of this effort, that there is a prospect of improvement in their lives uh, that merits them supporting uh, our effort and in, in really their, the effort of their forces. You may have seen, by the way, I think it was yesterday it was announced uh, that the JCMB, one of the joint boards uh, of international organizations, uh, ISAF and uh, Afghan leaders, uh, approved an end strength for the Afghan National Security Forces, that is, a uh, good bit, a little over 100,000 more than it currently is by October of 2011. Right now it's a little under 200,000 in strength right now. Um, and that's indeed with a verification process going on for those police who are on the books. And then uh, a little bit over 300,000, uh, 305 or so uh, by October 2011 is the new ap approved uh, end strength for that time. And then we'll see where it goes after that. There's also an end strength for October 2010. Okay, well, let me get out to the rest of you all, so we have a little, um, let me start over there and we'll work our back, back this way. 
General John Alterman. I run the Middle East program here at CSAS. I want to ask you about Yemen, which you mentioned briefly. Yeah. As you know, Yemen has a host of problems which are only tangentially related to our concerns with Al Qaeda. They have a, an active insurgency in the north, uh, rebellion in the south. They've been pouring tremendous scarce resources into fighting both of those. I'm wondering what steps we've taken, what steps have we taken to ensure that the resources we put into Yemen stay focused on our issues in Yemen, not only given the fact that they're diverted in the north and south, but also they have a history of diverting the weapons that come in and shipping them right out to fight other insurgencies, including against us in, in Iraq. So especially yep. as we're thinking about a light mm -hmm. presence for ourselves on the ground, how do we make sure that the Yemenis we're supporting are doing what we're asking them to do? Um, we partner with the elements that are focused on the extremists of most concern to us, and that is, of course, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, given that name this past year, franchised now by uh, Al-Qaeda senior leadership in the federally administered tribal areas, western Pakistan, mountainous region, border with Afghanistan, as you know. Uh, prior to that, they were Al-Qaeda in Yemen. Um, and there are certain units, there are three of them in particular, uh, that tend to focus on that particular challenge to Yemen, and not surprisingly, those are the three that we have focused our efforts on. By the way, this is not something that is a total surprise to us at all. Um, I've noted that uh, Yemen was very much in my sights uh, as much as two years ago, when as the commander in Iraq, we were, we were looking very comprehensively with the entire interagency uh, a lot of effort with state, with the state counterterrorist ambassador at that time, Del Daly as well. Um, Treasury, uh, great hero, uh, Stuart Levy, the undersecretary who does designations. Uh, and again, the entire uh, interagency was working to try to cut down on the flow of foreign fighters into Iraq. At that time, it was as, as high as 120 or so uh, per month through Syria, uh, principally. Uh, and we had to cut that down. So we went after what we could do in Iraq, needless to say, with various uh, special and conventional forces to go after the uh, foreign fighter infrastructure. The emir of foreign fighters indeed was killed uh, in Iraq, I think, in the fall of 2006. Uh, and then we also uh, worked hard with elements in the interagency and, of course, the intelligence community as well uh, to work with host governments, source countries from which military-age males used to be able to fly in a one-way ticket to Damascus, something that most countries uh, outlawed around that time. And uh, over time, the combined effort, external and internal, reduced that flow to now it's down under, <laughs> under 10 or so per month, and that's very significant because, of course, a number of those used to blow themselves up inside a rock targeting uh, innocent, innocent civilians. And you might recall Abu Ghadiyya, the, the foremost facilitator uh, also was taken out of the mix uh, about a year and a half ago, or a little less than that as well. Um, now, part of the, the uh, target countries, if you will, that we focused on as the source of foreign fighters, uh, and, and one that emerged, uh, loomed ever larger, was Yemen. Uh, we all knew uh, Qasem al-Rimi and others escaped from jail back in 2006, about 20 other hardcore al-Qaeda fighters, uh, and he escaped. We knew they were there. We knew cells were going in. We knew it's a very rugged area. Of course, there was an operation uh, in, in there some years back as well. Um, and you had a lot of political dynamics and these other challenges, the Houthis in the north, the southern secessionists, economic, social, political issues that were all uh, really occupying the attention of the government. Uh, and when I took over as Central Command Commander, uh, I announced right up front in the early guidance that the, uh, one of the countries on which we were going to spend a great deal more uh, time and effort was Yemen. Uh, also, obviously, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Lebanon, interestingly, we had some interest there. Uh, but Yemen was very, very uh, uh, prominent in that guidance. And in fact, I made the first trip in there as a Central Command Commander, I think it was in November or December of 2008. Uh, candidly, that we had some what diplomats call frank and open discussions during that particular visit. Um, but as you know now, because it was then released, I think a month or so ago, uh, I had a very, very good trip in July. In the meantime, we had an, uh, a Central Command uh, country campaign plan 
uh, in April that we did with the, in coordination with the ambassador state, uh, other uh, interagency groups, uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, and then after the meeting in July, uh, which was a literal and figurative embrace, um, we got on with building the kinds of uh, efforts that are necessary to develop above all the intelligence baseline that then enables you subsequently to uh, help the Yemenis uh, and to conduct operations. And indeed, it was that effort that as the threat stream started to come in in the late fall, uh, enabled the operations on the 17th of December, the 24th of December, and a host of others, uh, that, uh, right up until I think it was the last 24 hours, the Yemenis had a very good operation as well. Um, in these operations, two training camps were targeted, uh, three suicide bombers were killed uh, that were literally on their way into Sana'a. There, there was solid gold intelligence on that, and the fourth one was captured by the Yemenis with his suicide vest uh, still on. Uh, a very senior AQAP leader was killed. Others were either wounded or, or very narrowly missed, uh, and that pressure has continued. I think periodically the Yemenis will announce uh, this operation or that operation. Uh, and, and that does continue. And again, to come back to your question, um, we are focused on supporting, first and foremost, those who are dealing with that challenge. But I think, to be fair, you also have to then help them with the greater challenges, not necessarily with stuff that, that they'll necessarily use with the Houthis or the Southern Secessionists, but with uh, uh, development aid and so forth that can help them deal with the economic issues that are often reasons that individuals are willing to become extremists or inclined to become extremists in the first place. Uh, very tall order, but it, requ and it requires not just a whole of U.S. government approach, but a whole of government's approach, because of course the Saudis, the Emiratis, a number of the Imanis, a number of other governments in the region uh, that I've talked to uh, about Yemen have an enormous interest uh, in helping uh, President Saleh and the government there uh, keep the country together uh, and then deal with some of these very difficult issues uh, that have led to the situations that they find right now. We'll go right there. Sorry. Sorry. Good morning, General. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Bob Dreyfus with The Nation magazine. I have two quick questions about AFPAC. Um, one is in reference to the Washington clock that Marin talked about. The President as you know, has set a deadline of July 2011. I think, was it August 2011? Or? Uh, August 2011. Okay, don't, don't start sliding it to the left just yet. <laughs> I think he was thinking about May, perhaps. Uh, uh, to, you know, not just to demonstrate success, but actually, as I understand it, to start uh, a withdrawal. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering... Start a transition that is conditions-based of <laughs> tasks from our forces to... Uh, Afghan forces, again, in areas where those forces and the situation allow it. Uh, and the key words are conditions-based. And you'll recall this whole discussion when I was in Iraq about conditions-based as well. I, I might point out, by the way, that people have said, well, General, you never agreed to timelines before. Uh, I've never been a wild fan of timelines, but at times I have indeed announced timelines myself. Uh, again, conditions-based ones, but in September 2007, in the testimony, uh, before the four committees on Capitol Hill, I, I did announce, for example, that the first of the surge brigades was going to go home in December of 2007 and then laid out the uh, rough proposal for the remaining four to go home as well. But Sorry, go ahead. Well, in, in any case, the way I read the President's comment is that perhaps the pace or the degree of the withdrawal might be conditions-based, but in fact, the, a withdrawal would start uh, on that date. So my question is, uh, what kind of plans are you making, um, you know, as, as the contingency, since it isn't that far away in military terms, what kind of plans are you making? Uh, it's quite a ways away in military terms. I mean, <laughs> don't then, get me wrong, but, um, I mean, our focus right now, candidly, is on getting all of these forces on the ground as absolutely quickly as is possible. And by the way, pay no attention to these, pay no attention to these reports that have said that, you know, there's some kind of difference of opinion here on how fast to deploy. Everybody engaged in this, from the president all the way down to the lowest ranking member of the deploying forces, is making an effort to get in there as rapidly as is absolutely possible. Uh, we, we committed, to, the secretary committed to the president, I did as well in the sit room, that we would get, uh, again, virtually all of the combat forces uh, on the ground by the end of, of August. There is one element, a division headquarters, that's not needed 
uh, prior to then that will come in after that. But otherwise, virtually all of those 30,000 uh, will be on the ground by uh, the end of that time. And that is something we're all pushing. By the way, we're also obviously watching very carefully uh, as we are providing, re as the U.S. military and DOD are providing resources and the government to Haiti. Uh, and uh, so far, there's been no impact whatsoever other than the slippage of one uh, airframe that was used to bring in the air traffic control tower, a critical piece of equipment. Uh, I think it was an AN-124 airframe that did a contract uh, down there, and that just caused a 24-hour slippage of one, uh, again, airframe's worth of uh, kit going to Afghanistan. 24th Mu, the Marine Expeditionary Unit that is announced as diverted down to Haiti, uh, was going to go through the European Command en route to Central Command anyway. It was actually not intended to go on the ground in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, it was to be the theater reserve. We always have a Marine Expeditionary Unit uh, with several amphibs uh, in the area. We have occasionally put that on the ground, but relatively rarely. Uh, and indeed, that's what that force is intended to do. And so far, it is still intended to do that. And if, if necessary, we can extend the existing force that's out there for whatever period of time is necessary until it, until it arrives. But right now, there's no, no uh, plan or necessity to do that. Uh, sorry, let me, let's just do Tony. Okay, <laughs> sure. And then we'll head back there. Tony Cordesman. Tony Cordesman, CSIS. I'd like to go back to clocks in Afghanistan. One of the clocks we don't really talk about is our NATO and ISAF allies. And you may not talk about it. I can assure you some others of us do. We don't, well, I'm sure you do. We don't see much of it in the press or the media, however. And when you have as many national caveats as you've had, <coughs> when you have the military who are running various areas often decoupled from the national PRT under them, the question really is, can we get the level of coordination both military and civilian from our allies, it's necessary to make the president's strategy work. Um, let, me, let me sort of frame this a little bit first, if I could, uh, Tony. And I mean, first of all, we really mean it when we say that we obviously don't want to go it alone in these kinds of endeavors. Uh, and, you know, having said that, Winston Churchill, of course, an ally, uh, had it exactly right when he said that the only thing worse than allies is not having allies. Um, and, but look, this has always been this way. Um, even when I was the chief of, of the force operations in Haiti, as an example, in the mid-1990s, not necessarily a combat operation. There were some operations to get some bad guys, but by a small subset of the force. By and large, a, a peacekeeping humanitarian assistance operation, there were still caveats even there. Uh, in Bosnia, when I was the chief of operations uh, for ISAF and some other hats, I had an actual matrix on my desk with the countries down the left side, the tasks across the top with as much definition as we could, um, and then a check in the box as to whether or not that country could perform that task in that particular area. Um, in Iraq, we had all kinds of caveats in Iraq as well. And let's not forget, this was, yes, a U.S.-led multinational force, but the entire southern part of the country from Baghdad on down for quite some time really was all in the hands of non-U.S. coalition members. And I think, so you have to then say, okay, this is reality. What you're going to try to do, needless to say, is get as many contributions from as many partners as you can. Uh, you are then going to identify what the strengths are of the, of the elements that you have, what the shortcomings are, what the caveats are. Uh, you're going to obviously look at the mission and the campaign plan, and then you're going to figure out how you capitalize, you exploit those strengths, make the most of those, and obviously compensate uh, where necessary uh, for the shortcomings, the weak weaknesses, the caveats. Um, so, and there's a point at which you actually have to just sort of stop whining as a commander. We're, and I think the military is long past that. But you just stop that, again, identify the strengths and weaknesses and figure out how to best try to get the job done with the forces that you have. Um, not to say you don't ask for more if you need them and all the rest of that. And, you know, 
so forth. But in this case, I think we're up to somewhere, I, I, the latest is somewhere set between seven and 8,000 additional uh, NATO and non-NATO uh, ISAF coalition partner forces, non-US. Uh, I think that's gonna continue to grow. Uh, there are some really important uh, niche capabilities that are also now coming in because of the advent of the NATO training mission in Afghanistan and the way it's been blended in with the US-led Coalition Security Transition Command, Afghanistan C-Sticka. So you have trainers now that will increase the capacity uh, of your throughput, your output, uh, of the <coughs> Afghan National Security Forces training tasks. And you actually have the EU poll that finds that that's a very important place that they can contribute and some of the uh, gendarmerie type units like the Italian Carabinieri uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and again, um, there is an enormous amount of discussion ongoing, you should be assured, uh, behind closed doors, and, and it's nice to know that it's not all necessarily spilling out into the press, uh, about uh, which countries could indeed perhaps uh, do a bit more, which ones have certain strengths in their forces uh, that uh, have some capacity that could be brought to bear. Uh, and then in some other cases, of course, just, you know, we'll take contributions, you know, mon monetary contributions too. So again, uh, I think Afghanistan certainly merits all of that, and, and that's the approach that is being taken uh, with considerable emphasis as we approach the big conference in London, which is a very good action forcing mechanism, uh, not just for additional contributions, but also for discussions on uh, reintegration policy, uh, the, the civilian uh, uh, counterpart issues in, in Kabul and those kinds of things. I'll go right there, blue tie. And I'll keep going this way. Jeff McCausland, Penn State University. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Hey, it's good to see you. Uh, I want to broaden today the question on Afghanistan for a second. Back to your slide, uh, you know, the Iraq does not equal Afghanistan. One of those certainly seems in logistics, the exponentially and much yes. more difficult yeah. problem. Yep. As somebody said to me the other day, this is the only war where you, you have to drive through the insurgency with your logistics to get to the good guys to go back and attack the insurgents. Yeah. And as we try to expand that, because right now we're very dependent, I know, on line networks from Pakistan, that brings into cooperation with many other countries that people don't talk about in Central Asia and how we can broaden oh, no, I'll those. be happy to explain it to you. And then finally, uh, <laughs> of course, there's even implications for the Russians. Obviously, we've been talking to the Russians about yep. using that, and that doesn't mm -hmm. seem to go too well. Can you uh, oh, talk to us about that a bit? Ah, uh, to the contrary. I'd be happy to. Um, First of all, you have made, a, as usual, a great point here, and that is that the infrastructure in Afghanistan, and again, this is a case of Afghanistan does not equal Iraq. There's not all kinds of Saddam era infrastructure in excess quantities into which the 30,000 surge forces can go. Uh, yes, we did indeed then expand that footprint very dramatically, as I mentioned, 77 additional bases just in Baghdad alone, but in the same in all the other divisional areas so that we could indeed live with the people as we were uh, endeavoring to secure them and so we could hold areas that we fought to clear and so forth. Uh, but the fact was that in Iraq, uh, we had Kuwait right there, we could drive right in. Uh, you, you could actually come in through Jordan and, uh, and, and by air from uh, other directions as well. The vast infrastructure, all kinds of excess uh, airfield capacity in certain areas and so on. Uh, some pretty crowded like Baghdad International, but generally not, not a big issue. Uh, Afghanistan is the opposite of that. Of course, it was, I think, you know, what was it, the poorest country or among the poorest countries in the world uh, before 30 years of war did such colossal damage to it. There is a fair amount of Soviet-era infrastructure, but that's long since been, been occupied and the capacity vastly exceeded. So there's quite a building boom going on. Some WAG the other day, in fact, uh, uh, assessed that this is the largest building boom in Afghanistan since Alexander built Kandahar. Uh, and I think that may be accurate. Uh, there is a huge amount of construction uh, to develop uh, additional airfields, additional ramp space, uh, additional forward operating bases, combat outposts, and, and all the rest of that. Um, and indeed, enormous pressure on the two southern lines of, of communication, the one that comes through the Khyber Pass, and there's enormous effort by the Pakistanis to keep that open. They're really not driving through insurgent-controlled territory because indeed this is the this is a hugely important source of income for the tribes in those areas as occasional attacks, but really nothing serious for, gosh, I think maybe almost a year now or so. Uh, I remember one time, even during those attacks, it was less than 0.1% of 1% uh, 
uh, of what flowed in there. It's a huge number of containers. Uh, another route up through Shaman uh, in, the, in the Quetta area uh, there as well. And those are really, again, almost maxed out in terms of, so about a year, over a year ago, I started going up into the Central Asian states together with uh, the great General Duncan McNabb of Transcom has done a terrific job. And together, uh, CENTCOM, Transcom, and so-called Logistics Nation, as they're proud to say, um, even more fierce fans of Logistic Nation I am than the Boston Red Sox, especially since I'm a Yankees fan. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this is, we, uh, the Northern Distribution Network has now been established. And there's about, there's now I think five routes in. There's now even a route that comes out of Iraq, goes up through Turkey, I think through Azerbaijan across, you know, the two bodies of water, ends up in Kazakhstan, I think, and comes down through Uzbekistan. There are ground routes that come through Russia. Russia has been very cooperative, actually. Um, and indeed, uh, our approach in the Central Asian states, at least, has been to propose uh, to really all the states in that region, Russia among them, that the so-called new great game, the new competition for power and influence in the Central Asian states ought to be replaced by a broad partnership against extremism uh, and against the illegal narcotics industry, both of which threats uh, are very real to those in that, that part of the world. Uh, this has helped rebuild the Northern Distribution Network. The key piece was Uzbekistan, and once President Karimov gave me the go-ahead uh, for that early in uh, 2009, uh, that was the, what provided uh, the final piece in this, although we have a number of air routes that also go in. We also obviously had to work with Kyrgyzstan uh, when uh, there were some issues about the Manas Air Base, which is now the Manas Transit Center, uh, being closed. Uh, it was not, uh, there's a good partnership there now, uh, and that's going forward as well. So a lot of effort to try to expand all routes into Afghanistan, because this surge is frankly vastly more logistically challenging than was the Iraq surge. Uh, although Iraq, I think, arguably was vastly more out of control. Uh, you know, when you have a situation where there's 53 dead bodies per day in Baghdad just from sectarian violence, that's a pretty bad security situation uh, from which to begin. Uh, let's go here. That green shirt, sorry. I'm ben, right here. Yeah. Hey, Tony, how are you? Hi, sir. Uh, Tony Capasso yeah. with a Bloomberg. The Congress this year passed $6.6 .6 billion to help increase training in, of the Afghan security forces. It's a, that's a major boost from the 09 budget. What steps are you taking or, or will you take to make sure that not only is the money effectively spent in creating a viable force, but also efficiently spent so that two years from now we won't get stories or cigar reports saying much of this was squandered in corruption and uh, yeah. small payouts? Yeah. Um, there are a number of these. Uh, let me just make sure I capture these. There's quite a comprehensive effort uh, in, in this regard. Um, first of all, the Joint Contracting Command Iraq-Afghanistan, which we created several years ago, and the headquarters of which used to be in Iraq. Um, we have shifted quite a bit of the focus for that organization, needless to say, to Afghanistan. And they really work under CENTCOM now, rather than it used to be sort of worked under the MNFI commander, although they did do Afghanistan as well. Uh, so there's quite a shift in focus and assets in that very critical element. That was formed in the wake of CPA and, and the rest um, to use the resident uh, contracting expertise uh, in the military services and DOD at large uh, and to provide the kind of expertise and technical competence that, that we need to carry out very, very large programs. Um, second, you mentioned SIGAR, uh, and indeed SIGAR is being augmented. And, and I have committed uh, to Major General Retired Arnie Fields uh, that we will provide whatever he needs to ensure that he has access to uh, our different bases, our processes, uh, our contracting, and, and all the rest of that. Um, then, of course, we have substantially upgunned uh, the overall train and equip mission. 
uh, used to be only the U.S.-led uh, Coalition Security Transition Command Afghanistan, CSTICA for short. Uh, it is now that plus NATO training mission Afghanistan that gets much greater NATO uh, contribution to it. Uh, put a three-star general in charge, Lieutenant General Bill Caldwell, very, very highly competent, extremely uh, uh, thoughtful, visionary, uh, energetic, and so forth. He replaced me out at Fort Leavenworth for what it's worth, so we have great confidence in him. Um, and uh, so he is in charge of that. We've, again, added to his uh, overall strength and tried to help build an all-star bench uh, that supports him there. Uh, we are substantially increasing the numbers of trainers and then partner elements uh, for the Afghan forces when they're going through training. The ratio, in fact, I talked to Chairman Levin on the way up here today from Atlanta. Uh, he'd just been out there. He was really quite heartened to hear how the ratio between trainers and uh, Afghan forces is going to be substantially increased, and which was necessary, by the way. I reached the same conclusion some time back. In fact, we are going to use uh, the next infantry battalion that goes in, the 2nd Battalion, 22nd Infantry, uh, for this kind of trainer role, um, just as we use the 4th Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division in the partnering role down in Regional Command South to, to mirror what we'd already done with the 48th Brigade of the Great Georgia National Guard uh, in Regional Command East. And we're dramatically increasing, uh, uh, General McChrystal placing very good emphasis uh, on the partnership programs, and indeed uh, a number of the additional U.S. forces will have partnership responsibilities in addition to area of responsibility uh, security tasks uh, as well. And then finally, we've also uh, brought in different uh, outside uh, groups and consultants and so forth to take a look uh, at the program at different times. Uh, I, in fact, contracted one of those uh, at Central Command Headquarters ourselves. That's for internal use, and, and that's what, how we are using that. Uh, but that is yet another, and it was at the request of General McChrystal. So again, we're trying to get uh, as many different ways of looking at this uh, as is possible. And uh, we are also doing what we did in Iraq, by the way, uh, which is inviting a variety of the different audit agencies and inspector generals in. Um, we brought in the Army Audit Agency to Iraq every chance that I could basically get them in. They did at least two or three looks, for example, at the CERP program there. Uh, we had the DOD IG in a number of times as well to look at, for example, weapons accountability of the Iraqi forces, and we've done the same thing in Afghanistan. Go ahead and... Hi, General. Uh, Todd Bear from Al Jazeera English. Are you able to talk to us about these uh, biblical messages that have been sure, found you bet. coded yeah. on the weapons of yep. uh, troops yep. in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and why this may be a problem, a uh, perception problem for what the real intentions are and how long you have known about it and what will be done about it? Um, it is a perception problem, uh, without question. I mean, that's why you're asking the question. Um, and it is disturbing. Uh, to us, frankly, that this was done. I've known about it for about 24 hours, I and mean, probably not even 24 hours. I think it was sometime uh, yesterday or yesterday afternoon. Um, and in fact, uh, DOD has put out a statement uh, on this. CENTCOM is actually just about to hit the send key uh, on a statement. Um, the <coughs> contractor uh, did this without anyone knowing it or even, frankly, noticing. Again, it's not an actual verse, as you know. It's a reference uh, to uh, a verse, uh, and it comes right after some other data and pretty small print on a data plate, and just folks just literally haven't picked it up. Uh, and so this is a big concern to the Army and the Marine Corps, uh, who have contracted uh, for these particular sites. That was obviously not part of the specification uh, in the contract, and they are uh, in some pretty considerable discussions right now. Uh, about how to deal with that, and I don't want to get into contracting uh, issues, but uh, I mean, I, sh I hope you can consense from that that this is of serious concern to me and to the other commanders uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, because indeed it conveys a perception that is absolutely contrary to what it is that we have sought to do. I mean, there's a, whole, there's a reason that we put people through cultural awareness training and try to give basic language training and a whole variety of other tasks that are conducted during the year that a unit prepares to go downrange. Uh, and I can assure you that there is much greater sensitivity among our troopers 
uh, about this kind of thing than apparently there is uh, in whatever contractor produced those sites. Uh, let me, anybody over here? Let me, okay, let's take right here in the middle right here. And then I'll come up here. Um, Morning, General. I'm Frank Sullivan, private citizen. Uh, <laughs> let me try to pull together a question that I think is is the qu my question. Sort of, can you could you comment on the ability of the Afghans to recruit, retain, train, and lead the force as they're trying to build to on somewhat the timelines you've got? It's you, know, you hear lots of stories about uh, retention of the Afghan yep. police and so sure. forth. Yep, I'd be happy to. Uh, in fact, I'm particularly happy to do it because there was a major upswing in recruiting in the month of December, uh, and that has continued into uh, January. In fact, there are actually more recruited in December uh, than the system could accommodate, which is obviously a, a very positive development after, frankly, not meeting uh, the recruitment goals uh, for the months prior to that. And frankly, not surprisingly, that corresponded with the announcement of some recruiting and uh, salary initiatives. Uh, and so again, and we found that in Iraq as well, by the way. Uh, and that's uh, when it comes to retention, you know, that's another issue that they are addressing. I've actually discussed this uh, at the highest levels uh, of the Afghan government. Others have, have had those conversations and it was great uh, to see the Afghan leadership come up with various proposals uh, and then uh, to announce those and then, more importantly, to see the effect of those on recruiting. Uh, retention, uh, so recruiting, if sustained, touch wood, um, will be on a glide, glide slope that allows the achievement of what are indeed, as you noted, uh, uh, fairly ambitious uh, goals of expansion of over 100,000 uh, over the course of the next uh, little less than two years. Now, retention uh, needs to be improved as well. Uh, I'm not sure that we have the data yet to show whether that is going to have the same kind of upswing uh, after the announcement of these various uh, bonuses and, and the salary increase, uh, but with no question about it that that, particularly in certain parts of the country, not surprisingly in the parts of the country where the fighting is the fiercest. Um, Training, uh, we have not had the capacity in the past, although it is very rapidly developing. That's why, as I mentioned earlier, we're literally diverting some uh, combat units to function as trainers. That's why we're soliciting for contributions for trainers uh, from various of the other ISAF partners and also increasing the Afghan uh, capacity to train because, of course, over time we want to hand that off. And indeed, they're there with us but the ratio has not been anywhere near what it needs to be uh, for the conduct of that training. Uh, leadership, I think, is always the long pole in the tent in these kinds of endeavors. It was in Iraq. It is any time you're trying to expand a force very rapidly, uh, that is a huge challenge. It's a particular challenge in a country where the illiteracy rate is so high, a country that suffered so much from, from wars of all kinds for over 30 years, uh, and where you haven't had the kinds of institutions developing uh, these military leaders or the pool of candidates to be military leaders. Uh, it, in fact, you know, there's, there's until just uh, a year or two ago when there was a, an Afghan uh, officer, I think, who made it through the U.S. Army Ranger School. It had been 30 years or, or more since uh, the last Afghan made it through Ranger School. And, He's now the Minister of Defense. Uh, actually, I think there's two. He's one of them. There's another, General Karimi, who also is, uh, something of which they're rightly very proud. But it had been quite a few decades since they went through Ranger School uh, as young officers. Uh, so there, that pool of leadership candidates uh, has certainly been, been, been mined already, if you will, for those that are available. And what you're having to do now is to develop them on the job. But it's one thing to develop an, an infantry trooper, a basic private soldier, perhaps even a young sergeant over time, but to develop company commanders, battalion commanders, and their supporting staffs, brigade commanders, uh, this takes, in our system, years of uh, education, experience, study, uh, and so forth. And it is very difficult to try to compress that for someone and 
to hand it off to them. Uh, so that, that is indeed a big, big challenge, and, and that's something we'll have to deal with as this goes along and have been dealing with, frankly. Honor to Borgrav. Uh, General, uh, the Pakistani army has been battling Taliban in South Waziristan since last October, and uh, they announced recently that they've stopped that offensive, I guess because of the winter. And now, as of yesterday, they're thinking of signing an agreement with Massoud in North Waziristan. And I was wondering what you, given the history of such agreements, how you react to that. React yeah. to that. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have not seen an agreement uh, with the Masoods. Now, of course, there are Masoods and then there are Masoods, as you know, and I suspect they are not seeking an agreement with the organization led by the former Baitullah Masood, uh, who, of course, was killed some months back. Um, let me just talk about Pakistan more broadly, if I could, because as, Ar as Arno knows, is one of the closest observers in here of Pakistan and years of experience on the ground. What happened about 10 months ago was very dramatic, and that was a true uh, sea change in Pakistani uh, public opinion, uh, the, the approach of the political leadership, and even that of the clerics to recognize that certain extremist groups, in particular the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP, and also the TNSM, uh, these, these groups were really threatening the very existence of Pakistan. So this became Pakistan's war on terror, not Pakistanis fighting America's war on terror. That is an enormous shift. Uh, and they showed that by then going into Swat Valley. And of course it was precipitated. The catalyst was uh, the Pakistani Taliban out of Swat Valley coming further south uh, in, from the northwest frontier province, threatening some of the more settled areas uh, and really uh, threatening the very writ of governance as they term it there. The result has actually been quite impressive. They cleared uh, Swat Valley and, and most of the Malakan division of the Northwest Frontier Province. Uh, they have held it, unlike previous times where they cleared and left. Uh, they are clearing and holding. You know the, the saying that in conventional military that uh, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. In counterinsurgency, amateurs talk clearing, professionals talk clearing, holding, and building, and even transitioning. And in this case, they have done all of those steps, and they're even thinking ahead to transition. The challenge is, of course, the limited assets that the government can support them with and that the military has access to, uh, to do the rebuilding and to do uh, the preparation for transitioning, even as they are working on holding uh, with the military forces. They then, so that's in, in the Northwest Frontier Province. They then were over in Baijur, Momon, and Khyber of the federally administered tribal areas. Did some quite good work there. There's still work going on without question in Baijur in particular. Uh, then down, jumped down into Eastern South Waziristan, really not even all of South Waziristan, focusing on the Baitula Masood organization uh, that uh, blew up the Marriott Hotel linked to the assassination of Benazir Bhutto and a lot of other uh, truly barbaric acts, uh, blowing up the visiting cricket teams, m numerous uh, Pakistani uh, officials and innocent civilians and even marketplaces, uh, and indeed have done quite good operations there. Quite a deliberate operation, but very, very mountainous terrain, um, very, very hard operation, and they have literally taken over all of that area that contains so much infrastructure. I've seen the pictures. I, I have been into Pakistan or met with the Army Chief about every 45 days uh, over the course of the last uh, 15, 18 months, starting with the first visit that was on meeting that was on an aircraft carrier parked off uh, southern Pakistan a year and a half ago while still the commander in Iraq. And uh, these operations that have been impressive. The challenge right now, though, is that there is a limit to their capacity to put more short sticks into hornet's nests. And they've got a lot of short sticks in hornet's nests right now. Uh, and they are going to have to figure out how to hold some of these areas through agreements with tribal elements, not necessarily uh, those that have signed on in the past with the Pakistani Taliban. Um, and in some cases, there are deals with other elements that are of concern to us as well, certainly. Commander Nazir, most likely, uh, and, and some others. Um, and but that's going to be the way ahead, I think. Our task, and Secretary Gates has reaffirmed that in, during his ongoing visit, 
has to be to show that we are going to be a steadfast partner, that we are not going to do to that country what we've done twice before, uh, which is provide a substantial amount of assistance, in some cases create uh, issues and challenges that they have to deal with in the future, like Mujahideen, and then leave precipitously and leave them with those problems. Let's not forget the 12-year period during which we did not allow Pakistani officers to attend <coughs> U.S. Uh, military education and training, a real handicap now. There's an entire generation or more of Pakistani officers who didn't have the opportunities that General Kayani, the Army Chief, had. He's now rightly a proud member of the uh, Command and General Staff College Hall of Fame at Fort Leavenworth. Um, needless to say, those shared experiences help enormously. Doesn't mean they're necessarily completely pro American for life, but it does mean, uh, again, that there is at least an appreciation for uh, our approach and, and typically personal relationships that help as well. So again, we've got to show that we are in this, that we are going to provide sustained, substantial commitment. And I think the Kerry Luger bill does that, very important, $1.5 billion for each of five years in terms of economic assistance. Uh, the commitments on the security assistance side, about like amounts uh, in a variety of different categories. Uh, our assistance to them, not in direct con combat, certainly. Uh, they see this as their fight, and that is heartening. Um, and they're, they are prosecuting it. Uh, so what we need to do is continue to support them. We need to rebuild partnerships, rebuild trust and confidence, uh, show that we are going, we are in this uh, to, a, as I mentioned, in a sustained, substantial way, uh, that we have mutual uh, interests and, and that we're going to carry, uh, to pursue them together. I think we, uh, maybe one two, more. maybe one more. Um, we'll go right there in the front, sorry. Uh, Charlie Stevenson, SICE. General, you're a longtime student of American civil military relations. What's your assessment of those relations today, and what are the greatest challenges? Um, I think they are very good right now, actually. Um, obviously, there was a period during this, uh, the discussion, right at the outset of the discussion uh, of the way ahead for <laughs> Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, in which, due to leaks and some other uh, activities. Um, there were some concerns that were raised, but I think, frankly, that the period of several months of very intense discussions, uh, I mean, I think it, and I'm a student of, as you noted, of civil, I mean, I wrote dissertation. I actually went one time and looked historically at all the times, for example, when the JCS met with the president, when combatant commanders, you know, it was really quite rare in the past for that to happen. I've also worked for a chief of staff and for a chairman and um, with the exception of the chairman during some ongoing operations, again, not that much contact. To have nine meetings, with, or eight or nine meetings with the president, and then another Oval Office session, and all the other ancillary contact as well from uh, combatant command activities and so forth is really quite substantial. Uh, and during that, uh, we sharpened our focus, we uh, tested assumptions and concepts and, and had some very good debates in the, in the real situation room. I hate to break it to Wolf Blitzer, but there is another situation room out there. Uh, and uh, in that room, um, again, some very, very good discussions. And I think there was, you know, I, as I look back on that, it, it, honestly, as I was flying back on Air Force One, in fact, from the West Point speech and talking with the president who came back to, to chat and so forth, um, at the end of this long process, I, I sort of th thought back and said, you know, there's been some pretty substantial team building that took place here uh, as well. And I think that that, that is the case. Uh, I think that that was, uh, you know, a byproduct of this whole endeavor uh, that was really quite positive as well. Okay, we'll take one last question in the front okay. row there. Teresita Schaefer, I'm the head of the South Asia program here at CSIS. General, could I take you back for just a moment to Pakistan? Uh, I spent much of my diplomatic career in India and Pakistan before I retired and went to, heaven, to CSIS instead of to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> One of the constants in our relationship with Pakistan, as you rightly noted, is their conviction that we are an unreliable friend. Another, however, is that every time we've had a big relationship with Pakistan, 
it has at the end of the day been founded on um, a false premise that our strategic objectives completely overlapped or very heavily overlapped. I think we have the same problem now and I think one of the things you're dealing with is that it's becoming visible. Uh, my two questions to you are, do you see us getting closer to a similar way of approaching Afghanistan and how do you deal with the gaps between our strategic objectives? Yeah, it's a wonderful question, actually, and I, th I thank you for raising that. Um, I think you are exactly right, and as I mentioned earlier, there are questions about our reliability. I thought you were going to say the only constant has it been our in occasional inconstancy or something like that, but I mean, that is exactly right. And uh, beyond that, though, I, I actually don't think it's a false premise that we think our objectives converge. I think we are very clear on where they diverge. Uh, I mean, we again, one byproduct of all of this contact with the uh, Pakistani army chief, for example, and a variety of other Pakistani leaders uh, has been indeed to recognize where it is that we do have mutual interests and, and where we do not. And in some cases where those interests actually are in conflict rather than in concert. And um, the result has been, uh, because of that recognition, uh, an increased effort uh, to try to uh, refine those, to try to figure out how you work your way through the fact uh, that uh, based on our history, uh, they see things differently. And based on their situation, they see things differently. Now, you asked in particular uh, about our approach on Afghanistan and their uh, approach and interest in Afghanistan. <laughs> Uh, and what we are doing there is, in fact, literally trying, we're starting, you know, sort of tr to build a foundation of cooperation that's initially founded on uh, cooperation of what goes on on either side of the border. Uh, there have been, for example, uh, various uh, statements, well, gosh, the U.S. closed out this combat outpost and the uh, Pakistanis on the other side and Bajur Momon didn't know about it. Uh, at the right level or there is or vice versa because there's a whole host dozens of uh, outposts on the Pakistani <coughs> side that are closed or open periodically as well and so what we did is we sent up a, a joint coordination uh, cell uh, right at Torkham Gate at the Khyber Pass uh, that's been in operation I think probably now for about eight months or so but it has really picked up steam uh, in recent months General uh, McChrystal has been uh, quite assiduous and energetic in uh, going to uh, Islamabad and then having General Kiani come to Kabul and then doing the same at lower levels uh, all the way down to Division Commander and Frontier Corps Commander, for example, to again coordinate what it is that we're doing. And most recently, we briefed them on the, the whole campaign plan for ISAF uh, and laid out our plans uh, for the future as they would, would affect uh, the Pakistani efforts on the other side of the border uh, and, and vice versa. And in fact, there is a recent Pakistani operation launched very recently uh, in which we were briefed on it ahead of time. And in fact, we changed some tactical dispositions of our forces uh, on the other side of the border uh, in response to that. So the goal is to, to build that, uh, to, to solidify those particular relationships uh, and then you continue to build it up from there. There are other efforts like that uh, by our U.S. interagency partners. Um, and I mean, some of these have been uh, fairly interesting. I remember, for example, a head of a very significant intelligence organization in the United States who thought it might be a nice idea to have the ISI chief on one side and the uh, Afghan intel chief on the other. And that was an interesting conversation. Uh, but actually, that's what you need to do. And uh, that was a good eight, nine months ago. And I'm not saying that, you know, um, everybody is linked arms and starting to sing the, the same tune or something like that. But again, that's where you start and that's, that's how you have to move out. And if you have ideas on how to reduce tensions between India and Pakistan, please send them to david.petraeus at us.army.mil. Uh, that's an important component of this, in truth, um, because uh, obviously, the historic uh, tensions there, the, you know, the historic enemy to the three wars, um, the attention on 
uh, India or India on Pakistan obviously uh, detracts from the attention that could be given to some of these internal extremist elements uh, that, that are, we think, and now the Pakistanis agree, uh, pose the most urgent, the most pressing existential threat to Pakistan itself. All right, we've got to stop there, I think, to let you get to your next engagement. If, again, if everybody could just please stay seated while the general takes off. Thank well, you thank again you so much. Thank you all very much. It's very good. Thank you. Yeah,